Welcome to NGA Notable Lectures, a podcast offering a deeper understanding of all things artistic. To inaugurate the 66th American Music Festival, Personal Visions, on March 8, 2015, at the National Gallery of Art, Guest Festival Director Roger Reynolds joined Tom Hamilton and Ross Carr to discuss artistic collaboration in the creation of multimedia experiences. Samuel Taylor Coleridge famously wrote about the suspension of disbelief, of giving oneself over to a constructed illusion. This discussion considers the ways contributors work together to reach an optimal balance among media in creating such experiences. Hamilton talks about altering vocal quality and assembling electronic aspects of the late American composer Robert Ashley's idiosyncratic operas. Carr describes collaborating as projection designer for Reynolds' work, including the image and light projections for the flight project portion of the Jack Quartet concert held later that day. As is said often, one thing leads to another. And I was having a conversation with uh, Charles Ritchie, Associate uh, Curator of um, Prints and Drawings, who is actually with us today uh, in the audience, uh, about a year, a year and a half ago, and he mentioned that he was doing a show of prints from the Canaan Collection, American prints, and that we got to talking about the idea of personal visions. I became intrigued with that notion and decided when I had the opportunity uh, delivered by uh, Stephen Eckert, uh, formerly the director of the music uh, portion of the National Gallery. Uh, when I got that invitation, I thought, personal visions, it sounds like an interesting thread. Where do visions come from? And most of all, when we get one, what do we do about it? That's, where, that's the rub, as it were. So today, the purpose of this event is that I hope we can illuminate a little what is behind the uh, effort to create a multimedia illusion. Um, I've invited two expert practitioners, Tom Hamilton and Ross Carr, uh, who will talk to you very shortly about what they do and why they do it and how they do it. At least that's my hope. Uh, Robert Ashley and I came to know each other it's difficult to uh, actually credit, but uh, more than 50 years ago, uh, we were in Ann Arbor uh, that time, and we were involved in beginning some activity that became known as Once. At that time, uh, Bob was beginning to use electroacoustic uh, elements in his work and texts but he had not yet become overtly theatrical. And uh, one of the first pieces that made a big impact on me was a piece that he called Public Opinion Descends Upon the Demonstrators. And basically he had a, a matrix of uh, a floor with four sections, and the four sections of audience were rotated each by 90 degrees so that each audience was in fact being looked at by another audience. Then behind each of the audiences, there were formidable loudspeakers. And from those loudspeakers came deeply troubling sounds. So he was working at that time with a very complex social and aesthetic purposes, uh, reconfiguring the way we thought about what aesthetic events were and, and could be. At the same time, I was involved with uh, uh, thinking also about how to get my interest in space, in particular uh, theatrical uses of space, uh, off out of my imagination and onto some kind of a platform. And I composed a piece called The Emperor of Ice Cream, which was based on a, a poem uh, by Wallace Stevens and had uh, four, uh, well, three musicians, a jazz trio, and two sets of uh, singers, four women and four men, and the score showed how they moved on the stage as well as when they did what they did. Over the years, uh, I did more, many more things uh, in different contexts. Bob moved from doing uh, the work that he had done at the Once Festival to uh, a marvelous piece called That Morning Thing, which was a kind of operatic uh, uh, extravaganza 
that Karen, my partner, and I recreated in Japan, memorably, in the late 60s. Um, he then went on, in particular, towards television and the 14-hour music with roots in the ether, which was, is, was an extraordinary accomplishment. So as both Robert and I moved from our early, let's say, quasi-student days and, and general troublemaking towards trying to become mature artists who were able to realize our ideas in some kind of public fashion, we realized, he before I, that collaboration was an essential component. And as you begin to realize that collaboration is uh, useful, you later find that it's absolutely necessary because it's simply not possible any longer to know all that there is to know when it comes not only to the uh, very enormously varied uh, kinds of musical visions and uh, uh, so on that, that exists, but the various mechanisms, the tools that can be brought to bear on the realization of imagined uh, uh, productions. So <clears throat> I want to start out by asking uh, Tom Hamilton, a composer and sound designer, to come up and to speak uh, a, a little and to show some examples of the work that he did uh, collaboratively with Robert Ashley. At the time that I was beginning to plan this, I, I called Bob's longtime partner, Mimi Johnson, and I asked her, who is the person who knows the most about the behind-the-scenes realities of Robert Ashley's work. And she said, Tom. Tom? I want to thank the National Gallery and Roger for inviting me here to share some of my experiences with the operas of Robert Ashley. And I'd like to thank Mimi Johnson, who has been the company manager all these years, uh, for giving me much consulting time and advice on preparing these remarks. You may have seen Ashley's most well-known opera, Perfect Lives, which debuted on television in 1984 and is currently being performed live by at least three companies throughout the U.S. And on March 11th, as has been mentioned, at 2.30 p.m., a video of his opera Dust from 1998 will be shown in this room. Today I want to show you a short montage that I've made of images and music from the quartet of operas spanning from 1985 to 1994, known collectively as Now Eleanor's Idea. The solos are sung by the prim principal characters of these operas, named Linda, Don, Junior Junior, and Now Eleanor, and they are sung by Jacqueline Humbert, uh, Thomas Buckner, Sam Ashley, and Joan LaBarbera, respectively. So let's play the montage of these excerpts now. Uh, I want to just uh, say as a footnote that I have to apologize for the uh, actual video quality of the excerpts. They're very old production slides, and we have found that uh, when projected this large, there, there is some breakup on them. Um, so we, we, uh, we, we include them for illustration of the ver verbal component, but the excerpts also cover a lot of music clips from these four operas. So let's roll that now. For the sake of argument, Don is Spain in 1492 and Linda is the Jews. Do you have a ticket? May I see it, please? The ticket says that it was issued as one or two. The ticket says that you came here with your wife. Where is your wife? Why is she not here? Ordinarily, we would not honor such a ticket, but today is a special day, so we will honor the ticket. Well, here's a cute little thing Just came out of the toilet And she appears to be alone A maid in distress Madam, my name is unimportant And this is my wife Whose name is unimportant And aren't you lovely Children whose names are unimportant We are the unimportant family But we are a family Nevertheless This is trust in me, a foreign thing This is Junior Junior speaking made it impossible from the start. I loved the two-tone shoes. I loved the bag. I loved the names, the angles of the faceplates, the idea of a special purpose. 
She makes a name for herself at work. She speaks sharply if she disagrees, attracting respect for her opinions. She wins a large cash prize in the lottery. She allows her picture in all the papers, showing a of this reading can you confirm? I will try to get this right the first time. Yes. There's more to it than that. To say just You recognized her. It's not the truth. more than recognition. The word is too secretive. It keeps one of the secrets kept in the dark. Make their lives exciting, I guess. The person described as soft is the same person in a different Because I care, I know, and I don't understand. Higher than eagles, he wanted to learn to fly. But why? You've Mexico, asked me that before, and you haven't answered. I've always answered and told you all. You I told me the message. Higher than eagles, he wanted to learn to fly. That's code if I weeks of this stuff I don't. First class citizen who in first class has never thought of. Do not curse. Who would curse? What is cursing class? To know not, to cure not bad. Start cursing this. Discovery that the man said is the tune. Not the words came as a stranger. The kind of speeding up there had been cost. Holy Jesus. Jesus Christ. Blood was shed that the laws of fire do not apply to banks. Among the different degrees of deadness found in rocks, deadest are the rocks from which we build our banks. Even well my said. bank is no bank at all. Well there said. is no wind in the bank, nor well speed, said. nor velocity. Well well said. There is only alignment. Well said. What could be simpler? Well said. Said.
and now on her rarely allows herself to talk. She is at the nadir of the cycle, that all humans share the nadir. Unlike its opposite, it's described. We can name it speaking clumsily, the approach of the end of the world feeling. It happens in men every 14 years. It happens in women every 10 years. Who knows why this difference should be so great? On a larger scale, it happens. I have studied your powers to find out who makes them and how they are made. I call this program the miracle of God. People's adventures here on Earth are amazing. Heartbreaking, too, sometimes. Here are a few we picked at random. Now, in your Lord, this is surgeon. Please answer quickly. Mi hermano called a few minutes ago. He asked me to do something. Muy misterioso. He asked me to go to the coffee shop where we always Loyalty does not improve the world. Loyalty does not ease the goal. It is indifferent to the end. Loyalty is the act of loving. It is the rash act of protection. Indifferent to consequences. It is not explained or shareable. It is unpredictable and rash. It is the guidance to clear action. Well, the Ashley Company performed these and other pieces in Europe and the U.S. in festivals and tours once or twice a year, and we also went on tour to Japan twice. In the years following, there have been about seven other staged or recorded full productions. In order to realize fully articulated productions of these pieces, we have always balanced concept with a healthy dose of practicality. For example, the pieces you just saw were often presented in repertory fashion, so set pieces and costumes were designed so they could be repurposed and put into new contexts, often to accommodate set changes, transportation, and budgets. Stationary blocking and poses were used to accommodate singers who needed to be at fixed positions for singing into microphones and controlling in-ear monitors. Other pieces have included tables in the set, so that the singers could perform from complex scores. In the original staging of the opera Dust, the singers were placed into separate booths that had electrically controlled glass fronts and video monitors overhead. An additional video screen above that functioned as both a set piece and a way of delivering fragmented supertitles to the audience. The Ashley Opera has always put an emphasis on transforming the overall sound world while still delivering complex speech patterns as clearly as possible. We were always looking for new ways to replace the room acoustics with unusual effects and treatments and replace the traditional orchestral instruments with electronic ones, still retaining the functionality of an accompaniment for the singers. Bob would first write prose text that would evolve into written scores with basic pitches specified for each singer, and chord changes laid out for eventual orchestration. The singers would have their scores available months in advance of the first rehearsals. We would do early rehearsals with the singers after constructing just their cue tracks, which consisted of basic harmony, entrance cues, click track, and verbal line count. We could record rehearsals in a way that synchronized with what we had made, and it would serve as a template 
for finally making the fully embellished electronic orchestra. All the sound elements were synchronized to run together, whether they came from computer, synthesizer, or multi-track tape recorder. These same synchronizing signals were often used to drive other elements of the production, such as lighting cues or video projections. For each of the operas, the actual production process took one to two years before it was on stage, and of course the written text was developed well before that. Our working relationship was always very practical, but ran the full gamut from blue sky experimentation to straightforward audio production. The studio itself was very modest. Bob always called it garage band technology, long before Apple appropriated the term. But we would just continuously repurpose the small collection of equipment to get what we wanted. He always went from the standpoint of, I'll know it when I hear it. Bob was very adept at choosing people he wanted to work with for a long time, then coaching and guiding them to develop their own roles and functions in the ensemble along their own lines. He likened it to Duke Ellington's orchestra, which he admired because the music was seemingly written to maximize the unique strengths of each band member. The singer, costume, and set designer Jacqueline Humbert and pianist and composer Blue Jean Tyranny were perhaps Bob's oldest collaborators, each having multiple talents that contributed to the work. And similarly, the visual elements were developed independently by each of their creators. Bob always gave conceptual input, but the actual design, specific elements, and their relationship to the music came about independently. Earlier video collaborators included Lawrence Brickman, John Sanborn, and Dean Winkler. The more recent pieces have featured collaboration with video artist and designer Yukihiro Yoshihara, performance artist Joan Jonas, lighting designer David Moody, director and performer Fast Forward, and photographer Philip McKenna. And next season we'll be presenting a new work titled Quicksand with the great choreographer and performer Steve Paxton. The various technology used in all these operas have changed, of course, but Bob's sonic transformation of the English language has always been at the core of the work. I started working in the company in 1990, and now I'm involved in two more posthumous operas and be beginning preliminary work on his archive. We've said our goodbyes to Bob, but we're able to stay in the present with his work. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, we'll get in a d discussion period afterward uh, under that a little bit more, under the rug, as it were. And now we're going to have a similar kind of uh, uh, exegesis from Ross Carr from a different perspective. Thank you. Thanks also to, yeah, thank you. Thanks also to the National Gallery uh, and the Music Department for all they've done to help us uh, put this project together. Um, it's really interesting to be given the opportunity to talk about um, production methods, not only as a practical uh, point of departure, but also as a conceptual one. Um, Roger Reynolds and I have worked together on uh, three major projects involving projection design in the last, uh, since 2007, um, and also have worked together on quite a few pieces which, which where my role was documentation. In other words, uh, the capturing of pieces on film. And so in a way, we've been working in two, two ways. One is the uh, creation of new work, and the other is the archiving of that work. And as a byproduct of that archiving, we often get to look at a piece from a distance, from, with a little bit of distance from the piece, and make assessments and ideas for what to do in the future. Um, so I'd like to, to first talk generally about the overall challenges of what I like to call integrated media, um, I find the term multimedia to be very useful as a general point of departure, but integrating media is really the goal, whereas multimedia is just a descriptor of a discipline. Um, let's see if I can get my slides going. Indeed. <laughs> um, so I want to talk a little bit about methods and concepts and how the two are wedded and, in fact, inseparable. Um, integrating diverse media in the realm of contemporary music is a challenging task. Uh, while the artist has the obligation to create a suspension of disbelief, which Roger alluded to is the illusion, um, it, it, we also must construct the assumed modes of interaction within each medium. What I mean by that is that 
each medium that's presented, each discipline, has a set of expectations which are born of convention. So over time, film, broadcast, performance, theater, dance, music has created conventions which then uh, foster expectations from audience members. When those conventions are disrupted, the question then becomes how to make new uh, conventions which are specific to a piece, how to create a new world that is only unique to that piece. Um, in recent years, a discipline has opened up which I think helps my role in these uh, productions, and the, that, that discipline is called projection design. Um, up until the mid-'90s, uh, projection was something that was done by a projectionist, and lighting design was done by someone who was a lighting designer. The nice thing about digital technology and its advances, um, especially also its re reduction in cost, is that lighting designers and projection designers are often now collaborating at the production level for theater, dance, and more and more often now contemporary music. I guess I should also just define contemporary music a little bit more loosely than one might imagine. Uh, contemporary music to me is just music that is written by living composers. Um, so whether it's in the pop end of the spectrum or the, the art music end of the spectrum, uh, it's all contemporary music and many of these same production methods are spanning that entire spectrum. Um, which I think is 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 a good is a positive thing to be able to have experts from from the uh, popular music world and classical music world using some of the same methods and learning from each other. So, uh, just to bring it back to my uh, relationship to projection design, um, I started working with projection as a video artist. Um, I'm first and foremost a musician, and uh, the other half of my career is in working with film and video as it relates to music. And initially, that was the goal was to create silent film accompaniment. So that's the first discipline that I think most people are, are quite aware of and have probably seen, a single video image film being accompanied by a pit orchestra. So it's sort of like a, an expansion of the opera, a late 18th century sort of dramatic presentation of an opera. Film starts to replace that, because up until 1927, the soundtrack wasn't capable of being synchronized with the film, so we had to have live musicians play. And that tradition still stands today. Uh, what that does is to create an expectation that the sounds being created by the pit orchestra aren't necessarily um, coordinated with what's called the diegesis of the film. They are, the, those sounds are designed to create an emotional context for the piece. And what projection design does is to push the relationship between projection and sound into something much more complex and with many more options than simply an emotional connection or a setting of the stage um, of intensity and, and emotional content. And I think I can actually refer to uh, one of Roger Reynolds' pieces that he and I worked on to, to re, um, let's see, what's the word, to sort of resurrect from its analog version in 1968. And that piece is called Ping. Uh, to briefly summarize what the piece is, uh, it's a piece for three musicians, a pianist, a flutist, and a percussionist. The percussionist also plays um, harmonium and tam-tam uh, uh, and cymbal. And the pianist plays inside the piano. And you can see here, these are the strings of the piano. And this, there's these geared motors that are ground against the piano to create a, a, a very intense drone. Um, so the piece has a lot of, uh, of this intensity, and accompanying that are images of a Bouteau dancer named Akiji Maro and texts by Samuel Beckett. So here we're drawing together three completely disparate um, disciplines into one integrated performance, and the rules for that integration are not clearly set. So they had to be invented for the piece. And so that's the first thing that I think about when working on a production like this is what are the piece-specific rules of the game? Uh, what, what are we setting out to do conceptually, and what rules are then created by that, and how can we work to, to make that world, open up that world to the audience? So Roger does that in a really uh, fascinating way, um, and uh, by creating sets of diagrams and instructions to instruct the performers how to deal with various media how to make a multimedia, integrated media presentation. What you see here is a diagram at the bottom. There's an icon of a 16 millimeter projector. And just above that, there are two 35 millimeter projectors. And what you see then is a bird's eye view 
of a potential staging of the piece. If this is the 16 millimeter projector, these are the 35, that's one large screen, another screen, a piano, uh, the electronic sounds. And so you see a bird's eye stage plot or stage plan which attempts to navigate all the media at once. And I was inspired by this in working, on, working with Roger uh, to create several pieces that use diagrams to try and put all of the media into one, one location to test it. Because you don't always often have the luxury of, of having 16 millimeter projection and 35 millimeter projection in one place to, to test the result. Um, the second major project I worked on also had this testing phase. Uh, and the project was, a, was a, a large cycle by James Dillon called Nine Rivers. Um, the, it's for solo per- the middle movement is an hour-long solo percussion work written for Stephen Schick um, and performed with uh, three channels of video projection and eight channels surround sound. And this was my, uh, one of my first projects where I used multi-channel projection mapping. And that, that's a fancy term for using multiple projectors and allowing their surfaces, the surfaces in the space, to become the projection surfaces. So instead of relying on a single projection surface like cinema, like f- film accompaniment, we're allowed to create pl- a plurality of image surfaces. And I think the result then is that the focus, the attention of, uh, of the audience member is drawn around the space. So we don't expect the sounds to interact in the same way. In other words, you don't expect... Steve Schick to be creating a soundtrack for these three films. You instead allow this to become an image installation in which he participates. And this opens up many more possibilities for the integration of, of various media components. Here's another slide from of a, a close-up shot. Uh, Steve is such a, a dynamic performer that he draws much of the attention, and the projection actually folds into the background as a set as a set piece, as a scenery design. And that's one of my goals as a projection designer. But all of this piece started with a three-dimensional model, uh, which I often create with computer modeling to get a sense of the relationship of um, components in space. So this is taking what Roger showed me from his 1968 piece and sort of translating it into a, 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 with some help with modern technology to get a sense of how each component can interact. One of the second major pieces that Roger and I worked on together is, uh, was a piece called George Washington. It was premiered with the National Symphony Orchestra at the Kennedy Center uh, last October, uh, 2013, so a year and a half ago. Um, the piece is a, is a really interesting prompt, and I think the story of it helps to um, describe how integrated media starts with a concept and moves to a production. So if this is the final... The final scene, the, the Christoph Eschenbach on the podium, an orchestra of 85, uh, and three very large projection screens, each set into uh, um, four, uh, 12 panels each, so that there's 36 panels total. Rewinding to the sort of history of the piece, um, Roger was approached uh, by the um, Mount Vernon Ladies Association and the National Symphony, just to keep the story short, <laughs> uh, to create a piece that would focus on the life of George Washington. And as we know, there's the historical precedent of Copeland's Lincoln Portrait, which is a piece for narrator and orchestra, which serves as a kind of interesting... Um, warning. Warning, exactly. <laughs> point of comparison. Uh, or, or at least a, w- a model for how a, 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 um, a narrator and orchestra could interact. And our goal was to think of other ways to do it. And Roger spent uh, years um, reading about Washington and developing a very interesting text which aggregates quotes from all of his letters to Martha Washington, to the Marquis de Lafayette, and uh, letters spanning decades from his early days as a a war general, the presidency, and then finally in his retirement. And this text served as the timeline. It served as the overall structure for a piece about George Washington involving orchestra. Over the period of developing that, we also, he also decided to integrate various other media components, especially uh, live electronic sounds um, and video projections. The process of deciding which images would be involved and how they would be projected is the crucial step in the integration of media. Um, 
the the first step was to decide what kind of images we would use. And I think this this piece has an obvious um, sort of uh, point of reference, which is George Washington's own Mount Vernon landscape. So we spent one week per season for two years capturing imagery from the Mount Vernon estate, which is just down the street, uh, and capturing time-lapse photography, point-of-view photography, uh, videos and tracking shots of the, of the landscape to represent the seasonal shifts of the space and to, more importantly, allow the audience member to be transported into that landscape and to understand what it felt like to see the vistas and horizons and, uh, and changing of the seasons that Washington felt. So it serves as a scenic backdrop. Um, it also serves as a means of transporting your own um, uh, location to another place. And that's one of the strong, I think, advantages to projection design is its ability to do that. Um, this scene that you see here is a winter uh, shot of, the, of the, the chestnut tree, which is just outside of the, um, the Washington's cupola um, and his mansion. And on top of the, the mansion is the, this cupola that is made up of eight sides, each with 12 window panes. So the projection design is modeled on that. Each projection screen is, serves as a window out of George Washington's mansion, but also a window into George Washington's own mind, his thoughts, his office, his writings. Uh, it serves as kind of a, a window and a lens both. And this is our way, as, in, as the collaboration proceeded, of moving away from a cinematic presentation, moving away from an orchestra accompanying a film to an orchestra in a landscape. Um, that, was, that was the goal. And I think the scale and the, the uh, quality of the imagery and especially the quality of the place we were shooting, the beautiful Mount Vernon estate, were, allowed us to do that, allowed us to put the orchestra in this place and also gave a foundation for the, the text to be delivered by three narrators, one representing each phase of George Washington's life. So that piece uh, had a, a successful premiere in, in, um, at the National Symphony Kennedy Center, um, and we learned a lot about how to integrate these various media, especially in the digital age, um, and on, a, on that kind of scale. Um, the next project that we'll be presenting a preview of tonight at 6.30 in the, in the West Garden uh, is called Flight. And again, it's about a historical subject, but unlike George Washington's, it's less focused. It's about the general um, trajectory and chronology of the experience or the aspirations to fly of humankind. Um, and we are now in the phase of building all of the parts. Rogers has again assembled a text which is recited by four actors. And now we're working with these loose sketches to create the layering of media in time. So this is a, a temporal schematic, whereas the, uh, what I showed you before was a spatial schematic. We use this method to layer images that we might want to accompany sounds, texts that we might want to accompany images, and we play around with that layering out of time, out of rehearsal, in order to test various interactions. So I know it's a little bit hard to read, but these are blocking and staging notes. Uh, these are the, uh, the materials that are projected on the screens, go from paper to cloth to wood to 16 millimeter film to, uh, to steel and metal. And there are various trajectories all in parallel that help us to integrate various media components. Uh, but we also have to think about space. So we, I also create three-dimensional um, renderings in order to test the relationship between bodies in the space, in this case a string quartet and four actors, uh, things like music stands and benches and seats. They're things that are seen on the stage and they have to be considered. So we use these three-dimensional models to test uh, some of those ideas. Each of these boxes also have a conceptual foundation in that they're designed to represent both a box kite and a section of a biplane wing. The idea is that the biplane wing can become an object or a prop uh, and also a surface for projection. And I have one sample prop with me, which I'll show you a projection mapping demo in a little bit. Um, we had a, a ni really nice experience testing this piece. We're, we have a testing phase at San Diego. We've had a testing phase at James Madison University um, in Virginia, and, uh, and tonight we have a, a performance of the first uh, roughly third of the piece, quarter of the piece, in the West Garden. Um, 
This was one of the images of the quartet in the boxes with the projection falling on them and uh, at James Madison University. And this is a, uh, an image of the two of the actors that you'll see tonight uh, with some of the images projected on the box. Uh, so I would, I would like to take the time to show um, w how I do what's called projection mapping and also first to explain why. L I've sort of alluded to the idea that much of integrated media strategy is to move away from a cinematic single channel production like this PowerPoint presentation and make it much more integrated and complex so that the conventions, the expectations of the audience as it regards silent film accompaniment are dismantled. Because if, if people come into an orchestra experience or into a string quartet experience expecting to see a movie, then the string quartet is reduced to an accompaniment role. And the big challenge for us in these productions is to try to make at least an attempt at an equivalence of the roles of the various, part, uh, various um, components. So in this case, the string quartet, the four actors, the projections. Uh, it's an extreme challenge, and it, it takes many, many um, iterations to get it right to achieve the balance. And sometimes it's about deliberately making an imbalance and allowing the string quartet to take the four for an, for an entire movement while the while the projections become purely scenic. Uh, and sometimes it's about allowing the projections to become a cinematic feature so that the other elements can become uh, an accompanimental role. So I, one of the ways I like to do that is to move the projection off of its role as a screen and into another role. As you saw with the George Washington piece, that took the role of windows, panes of windows and George Washington's mansion. Um, with the James Dillon piece, it was about creating the walls of the L.A. River Canal, angled walls that served as architectural features for the percussion to be placed in uh, as a piece about drought and about rivers and about Heraclitus stepping in the river uh, and making those screens into both a scenic and um, image conveyor. And the, this, this um, as I've described, is about creating box kites and biplane components that serve not only as projection surfaces but also as somewhat self-illuminating boxes. Um, and as I said, I brought one of these as a, as a sort of demo. And I'm going to show how this projection mapping works. How does the image get onto that box? Because I think by dispelling the sort of smoke and mirrors of it, it it'll show that the, the work that goes into it is, uh, is very strategic. It's not, there's no magic here. There's no, there's, uh, it's, all, it's all very... Um, uh, strategized and, and there's a lot of um, work that goes into it. I'm going to quickly set up a mock-up here with Brian's help, uh, the projector. So <clears throat> what we get to do tonight is put boxes on top of boxes as you saw in the image and somehow get the, uh, uh, the image to fall just on one of these surfaces. So there's a piece of software uh, which I use um, it's called Isadora, but there are several pieces of software that do this. Um, and the idea is that you can map, it's called projection mapping, map an image to just one surface. And now this is becoming quite popular in, uh, in outdoor spaces. People are mapping projections onto the, each brick of a building or a big surface. You'll probably see it in, in um, urban areas in the near future. Um, but for us, it's about reducing the scale to these small boxes. Um, and you'll see tonight that you can, we can aggregate several boxes into a structure and then spread an image across those. Um, the basic idea is if we start with a test image, like this one, old, old test tone sort of image, and um, I can then make this go from this wall onto that box with a couple maneuvers. I'll just drag the, uh, the, the software onto the screen so you can see what I do. Um, this is what the software looks like. It allows me to take a picture, connect it to a, a, a projector, and then manipulate that projector. And I'll just show you the results of that work. So first, the box is too large. <laughs> so let's make it smaller. We'll make it smaller. And now it's too high, so we'll move it down. I know it, 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 it seems so such a ridiculous task, uh, but this is exactly what projection designers are doing 
before every, every concert. And then the question is how to get it to map exactly to the oblique surface as opposed to a flat on surface. And then so you can drag each corner so that it maps perfectly. It takes some time, and um, I wish I had the coordination to talk and do it at the same time. <laughs> but uh, in the end, what I think happens is that after your eyes have adjusted to the new situation, and as the audience member, you wouldn't have seen this process, of course, um, it seems like the box is illuminated from the inside, which gives it a autonomous dimensionality that makes it seem, that highlights the object quality as opposed to its surface, projection surface quality. So there we now have uh, a box that looks as if it's lit from the inside. Mm -hmm. And I can replace that with a moving image. And if you have time tonight, I hope you can come see that. I won't give away the, <laughs> the phenomenon here. Um, I think we're now in the place where we have to take some questions and, and take our seats. Um, but So thank you for that. <laughs> Some waters here. I'll grab for it. Well, I hope you agree with me because I certainly found that uh, provocative and uh, informative. And I'd like to uh, ask the our our two speakers whether they would uh, have any particular questions for one another uh, as a result of what it is that you just heard. If, if not, I have some, but I'd, I'd rather leave it to you. Well, I, uh, was, it was really nice to see the montage, and uh, I haven't had the luxury of, of seeing a, a live production of Robert Ashley's operas, but I hope to. Um, and I, I really like what you said about how practical components were a function of the creative process just as much as the imaginativeness of, uh, of, um, of Robert Ashley. And I think that the interesting thing that you said is he, he quoted, or you quoted him saying, when I, when I hear it, I'll know it, or I'll, when I know it, I'll hear it, or whatever. And, and I wonder what, what the comments were along the way to get to him knowing it. Yes. <laughs> what was not working? What was not working? Well, uh, a typical thing we would do is uh, I might arrive in the studio in the afternoon and uh, Bob would have uh, worked in, a, uh, in something called a sequencer and laid in uh, pitches sort of in the abstract, just in a way that in, in a signal, uh, just in a sort of a signal or representational form, and then the goal in the afternoon would be to color that, to orchestrate that, uh, which seems like a simple task if you just are choosing from a menu of uh, sounds in a synthesizer. But uh, Bob didn't like to do that. He liked to uh, do things, if not from scratch, then in some transformative process. And so along the way to doing that, you have all sorts of choices uh, uh, that have to do with timbres, that have to do with duration, loudness, placement in the stereo space, and um, uh, things change depending on what beat they're on, uh, depending upon who's singing. Um, and so we would, we would work on some of these things, and uh, it would be sort of like, do you like this? Do you like this? <laughs> and uh, I would say, you know, do you want to put it in the next octave? Do you want to try it down in an octave? All these things. And, and finally, we would just get to the end, and something would just sort of hit. It was just as simple as that. It was just, just trial and error. And then uh, uh, we'd say print. You know, and then we'd lay it down to tape or whatever he, we had to do to, to freeze that element. That was well. One thing you mentioned, uh, or one thing that was very clear, and you did mention it, 
was let's say I'll 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 use the term vocal quality, yeah. but it, it's obvious that at the same time Bob was extremely interested in clarity, but a, a particular kind of clarity, yeah. and clarity could involve smudging or yeah. buzzing or doing something to distance or off center the experience. Uh, in some way that didn't still deny us access to it. Correct. And so then, uh, for example, that, that that each of the pieces have thousands and thousands of words. And sometimes those words are fragmented and spoken by one character at a time. And sometimes there is uh, a chorus that are speaking these things in, in synchronization against a solo voice. And sometimes there, there would be maybe three or four different elements going on at the same time. So the goal for me, uh, as the uh, sound mixer, uh, was to deliver something that had uh, the possibility for comprehension in, in, the, mo in the most ordinary sense of, of the word. In other words, it, it just whatever it was, it had to be clear. And so that involves differentiating. It involves yes. making things in some sure. consistent way unlike other things. Yes, uh, that's right. Uh, and it, sometimes it has to do with narrowing the range of some voices or putting uh, the voices in uh, different places in the stereo uh, image. Uh, and sometimes it's involved with using an effects treatment things like delays and reverbs and flanging and all these things that we've gotten from, uh, from the studio world and doing different things with different groups of voices to, uh, to, to sort of voice them differently. So it seems in a weird kind of way that you're sort of uh, disambiguating and Ross is ambiguating, or maybe it's the other way around, but it, it does seem, Ross, as though you're trying to keep things clear, but to distance us from our habitual expectations about how to see, how to hear, how to relate to an experience. That's right, and that's exactly what I should have said before. <laughs> that's, that's the really eloquent way of, of putting that the habits and uh, traditions and conventions that are built up by various media practices, and I, I constantly mention film and broadcast coupled with dance, theater, and music uh, create a lot of dissonance. And the, the expectation of a cinematic experience is quite different from that of a concert experience. So the first thing we have to do is make sure we're not doing either of those experiences, but instead creating one that's unique to, to the piece. Uh, of course, with an orchestra, we couldn't completely abandon the concert experience, but the hope was that we could transform the stage from the Kennedy Center itself into some other place. Um, and it's, they're lofty goals, and it ends up being a new set of rules for every piece, which is a realm I like to work in, but it certainly is not without its challenges. And uh, I'll just mention a, an example about the nature of those challenges, and I wonder whether this kind of thing uh, came into uh, Bob's work. Uh, you did mention at one point, Tom, that he was very uh, shrewd, I use that word, about whom he chose to work with. Well, uh, part of this, if you're working in a large uh, context, uh, such as the Kennedy Center, uh, there are some things you can choose, but there's some things you cannot choose. And when I decided to work uh, with three actors, the, the effort that I had in mind was uh, to recreate, in some sense, the intimacy which... Uh, Washington had experienced as he was actually sitting at one of his desks. That's one of the little odd things about uh, Mount Vernon. When you go there and you see his study, you see there are four desks, and you think, well, they must have been dragged in from other places. But in fact, just as we're talking about, Washington apparently had a different desk for different functions, which means that he was, in some sense, uh, disambiguating a uh, his his own situation, but so I talked to the actors. They were using wireless mics, and even though there was an orchestra there, it seemed feasible that they could talk. Let's say in a kind of informal way, as though you were sitting right across from them. 
But in fact, when you take a trained actor and you put him, in this case, on a stage facing 3,500 people, they begin to talk like this, and there is no way you can change that. <laughs> so documentation and special groups such as uh, the, the Ashley uh, Ensemble. And of course, uh, Ross, you work with ICE. Uh, you work with a variety of ensembles outside of our collaborative uh, uh, interaction. And so I, I'm, I'm wanting to close this part of it with each of you saying whatever it is that you might say to this audience about the things that are the most rewarding and the things that are the most problematic about the roles that you assume in different times. Tom? Well, I, I, think, I, I think the most rewarding part of working on these pieces was that I got to do it for 25 years and uh, that I continue to work with, with some of these pieces. And uh, so it's, it's developing the intimacy with the material the one-on-one uh, -on -one contact that I had with Bob for so many years. When I first started working on improvement, we worked every afternoon uh, from two to six, five days a week for a year. You know, that was, <laughs> that was like a job for a year. And so uh, it's varied from year to year and, and from piece to piece, but uh, that's, that's been the most rewarding and sort of working with this sort of second family of mm -hmm the same uh, performers and, and uh, just a very slowly changing cast over, over these years. Ross? Uh, well, I, I thoroughly enjoy wearing multiple hats. I mean, my primary job is as a percussionist with, with ICE, the International Contemporary Ensemble. Um, and the, the challenge there is also how to balance the uh, various needs at any given time, but it also has the reward of being able to have a bird's eye view on on the total scope of a production, and what I think I'm learning is how that production is perceived by an audience, what their what their experience is, and the interaction between performer and audience is heightened as as a result. So I think that while it's challenging to understand the full nature of a production, from lighting and sound to performance to to how the audience enters the space and leaves the space, uh, it also allows for um, some some interesting learning experiences and probably some progress in breaking down the traditions of, of uh, audience performer relationships so that they can be a little less less formalized, slightly more informal and, and uh, communicative. My prompt when asked by the uh, people at the National Gallery about the uh, content of this day was to say, Coleridge famously wrote about the suspension of disbelief, about situations in which one gives oneself to a constructed illusion and surrenders to the experience with a certain innocence. I think that these, our two speakers today, have both been engaged in collaborative relationships and we've heard a little bit about how uh, the magic that results in performances is hard won. It's, yeah. it's won by a lot of thinking, by a lot of uh, expertise, by a lot of time, by a lot of commitment. And these people, people like uh, Ross and Tom, are those that enable new things, new visions, new personal and otherwise, I hope even perhaps societal, visions to occur. I don't know whether we have time for uh, uh, two questions. OK, we have time for questions. If there are any burning questions out there, yes, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get you a mic, just a moment. OK, yeah, well, I'll, I'll say a couple things first. And that is that in order to, I, I mentioned at the very beginning that having a vision is one thing, and that bringing that vision into uh, a, a shareable condition is quite another thing. So if your vision happens to be uh, happens to involve extraordinary scale. And that's what Ross and I uh, are talking about and one of the things that he was demonstrating. We are now taking this huge scale that was necessary and proper to the, the Kennedy Center and bringing it into a form 
where we can do the piece in a satisfying fashion in a very wide variety of contexts, large and small. And I, I don't think actually, to be uh, frank about it, we'll ever face anything quite as challenging as the West Garden Court, uh, which is a complex, rich, uh, verdant space. How often does one perform in, in, in a condition like that? But the... The, indeed, but a reason, I think there, there are two key reasons for scale. One is, um, well, there are three. One is that it's an extremely important aspect of America and of America's aesthetic history. Scale was possible in this country, on this continent, in a way that it is not, let's say, in Japan or Central Europe. So this is one thing. A second thing is, that scale brings the potential of uh, administrative uh, you know, power and of uh, logistical, which is to say financial resource. These, these institutions run on big budgets and they are not thrown you know, into a tizzy by the idea that this actually may cost something to do right. And the other thing is that I think that scale allows a form of sharing that our iPads or uh, you know computer screens never will manage. So I think that there's an important element to the shared experience, to the use of great public spaces for aesthetic and artistic uh, uh, purposes and so on. So I'm very much for this transposition of function where possible, and that means you have to draw on the resources including financial resources of large institutions. An orchestra is a large and wealthy institution, whatever it is that they may tell you. And I, I mean, I, if the question was, was also framed as simply as um, why not use canned music if the orchestra was, uh, instead of the orchestra? Well, actually, the, the answer is somewhat complex. Um, the, f the, the first and most important thing, I think, is that nothing can match the intensity uh, of an 85-member orchestra all working toward the same end. That sort of communal, concerted effort is unparalleled. And it's one of the most magnificent forces in, in art, in my opinion, to see that, that happen in real time. Um, so that's not replaceable, and that energy isn't replaceable by canned music. Um, the, other th the other thing that's more practical is that the project was an initiative of the orchestra. <laughs> so they, they prompted us to make them a piece. Uh, they prompted Roger to 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 create a piece, and um, so we then couldn't fire them and play it out of a tape player. Uh, but that that's purely practical. But I think the most important thing is that 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 energy of, uh, and I rarely get to play in the orchestral context. I play with a thirty member group. But when when even when when there's ten and twelve, fifteen people, that energy of the of acoustic performers playing in concert is something you can't get with uh, loudspeakers. So, anything else? Um, I'm a docent here at the National Gallery, so I get the pleasure of speaking about either two-dimensional art or three-dimensional art. And what I love about sculpture is it begs you to look at it at every vantage point in the round. So with regards to your current projects or even performing up here today, it, do you have that capability of performing in the round with, you know, the audience in the, in the round? <laughs> The quick answer is yes, um, and this is this is our first time performing in a, in the round environment as opposed to in a proscenium where the audience is as you are to us, uh, looking in a binary. And in the in the case of the West Garden Court, there are five audience zones, all faced toward a central area, just um, just off center of the fountain, uh, and these boxes um, have the advantage of projection, both what we call front projection, which is what I showed you, mm -hmm. but that image was also going to show through onto the back. Oh. So you have two dimensions at least in terms of vantage points, and since the boxes aren't organized at 90 degree angles or in parallel, they're organized in all angles and in a kind of constellation or ruins of, of boxes, uh, absolutely you can appreciate it from, from all sides. And I think right now we're in the testing phase of the viability of three-dimensional appreciation of projection design for this particular project. So tonight we get to test it for, for you all, hopefully. Right. 
Give us some feedback after. Please. Anything else? No, I, I was, I was going to add uh, two things, to, something to both questions. To the first question about the issue of the orchestra, and I think uh, I could say that through many discussions over many years uh, with uh, Robert Ashley, he viewed the function of the accompaniment for these pieces as, as using electronics and electronic sounds out of necessity. He didn't want the historical imprint of traditional acoustic instruments. And uh, it also allow when you, when you start using electronics, it allows you to think of the actual layout and composition of the music uh, with a, a little bit uh, different kinds of layering, uh, sometimes different, different bookkeeping in terms of key, you know, the score itself, um, different transformations of the material. So for him, the idea of, of the electronic sounds put everything more in the present time uh, then you know if you if you strike uh, uh, if you hit a key on the piano or a bow of violin or whatever in those f first little parts those first few milliseconds that you hear that sound it's like the whole history of the instrument coming at you at once and he really didn't want that he wanted a different precedent. And then I wanted to address the issue of uh, the ability uh, to present the pieces in, in a different uh, kind of uh, arrangement, stage arrangement. And for the pieces that we were doing, which is uh, maybe a dozen full productions or more in, in the course of 25 or 30 years, the venues that we played at for the most part, were traditional proscenium-based uh, stages. Um, the the uh, staging itself was more tableau-like. There were a lot of fixed poses. I think I referred to that, and I think you saw that uh, uh, in in my video examples, sli you know, the slides. The uh, it's as if you were observing. Uh, you know, a singing picture in a way, or, or a set of singing sculptures. The, the, there was very little movement on stage. And so the, the proscenium setting, the traditional proscenium setting, uh, was absolutely perfect for those pieces. This has been a National Gallery of Art podcast. 